Welcome back to our series on introductory statistics. I'm Mark Ledbetter, and this is lecture video number six. We are in chapter two, part four. So last time we used our frequency table and our relative frequency table to make a histogram here of the commute times, and we also made a relative frequency histogram. You'll notice that the histograms have basically the same shape. We also talked about the different distributional shapes, but we failed to go back to our data and look at these to see what kind of shape it was. So looking at this, it would look to me like this is pretty obviously skewed to the right. So right skewed. So um, there are some people who commute a further distance, but there's fewer of them, so it's spread out or skewed or stretched to the right side. Uh, and the left side here looks pretty similar to what a mound shaped distribution would, but if, if it were mound shaped, then the line would come down like that, and it does not. So this is definitely skewed to the right. Okay. So this time we're going to talk about a cumulative frequency table and ogives go with that. We're also going to talk about bar graphs which are used for qualitative data and Pareto charts which are a very special type of bar graph. So why would we want to use a cumulative frequency table? Um, a lot of times we like to know the cumulative or the total number of values that have occurred up to a certain point such as um, the number of um, uh, uh, instances before a heart attack, let's say. Uh, these people have had uh, chest pains, and let's say up to a certain point, um, what percentage of these people have had that chest pain? All right, so we, we're going to use the um, upper boundary of each of the classes and calculate the frequency up to that point, which is called the cumulative frequency. It's the sum of frequencies for that class and all the preceding class or previous classes. All right. If we plot this on a line graph, it's going to be called an ogive. So um, this is for the daily high temperatures in Aspen, Colorado during the 151-day ski season. So as we did last time, we would make use the data to make to uh, calculate our class boundaries and our class limits. And we tally the individual values and find the frequencies. And again, when we add up these frequencies, they had best equal the total number of values. We said it was 151 day ski season, so we should have 151 values. So how do we calculate this cumulative frequency? Well, the first one's very easy, it's the same. So once we have the first cumulative frequency, we take it and we add it to the next frequency. And that gives us the next value. So 23 plus 43 is 66. Then instead of adding this and this and this and then stopping and then adding this, this one and this one and this one and this one, it's easier to use the value that's already in your calculator, the 66, add the 51, and get the 117. And you can just keep doing this until we get the total value, which is 151. Please do not add these up. It makes no sense to. You've already added them up as you went, so this value needs to equal the total um, frequency uh, for that column, okay? So we stop, or we should be at the end when we get to the same number here. If not, we've made a mistake. All right, so that's how you make a cumulative frequency table. Now, an ogive. How do we do that? Well, here's the rules. I'll let you read through that at another time, but let me describe what we do. So what we do is we take these boundaries, and we plot the boundaries here. And so for the first boundary of the first class, we plot a zero. And then for the first class, we go to the upper boundary and we look at the cumulative frequency and we plot that. And so using the upper boundary, we plot the frequency, the cumulative frequency for that um, class for each of the upper boundaries. All right. But the first boundary of the first class, we plot a zero 
and then we use the upper boundary for the cumulative values. Okay, and we connect those points with a straight line. So easy enough, right? And over here, we have the cumulative frequency as our measure on the vertical axes. So if we ask this question, um, estimate the total number of days with a high temperature that's lower than or equal to 40 degrees. Well, we find this number that's above 40 degrees. It's a boundary, right? So, um, and we know that we're only using whole numbers. So we look here and we see, well, 40 would be uh, within this class to the left of this value. And so we go up and we see that the answer is going to be 117 days. So out of 151, 117 days had a high temperature that was 40 or lower. Now let's talk about a bar graph. So we use histograms only for quantitative data. We can use a bar graph for qualitative or quantitative data. So most of the time we don't use it for quali uh, quantitative data, but we could. So um, we can again make them horizontal or vertical, the bar graphs, and the lengths of the bars are going to represent either the value, if it's a quantitative data, or it can be a frequency or a percentage. Always put a title, a label for each of the axes, and in this case, for a bar graph, we need a value or a label for each of the bars. So let's take a look at a bar graph. Here, this is more complicated. This is called a clustered bar graph because we have two bars for each value or each uh, category. So this category is 1980. Here's 1990, 2000, 2010. And we've got a different color for men than for women. And this is life expectancy, so we have age over here. And so we have these different um, average life expectancies based on when somebody was born. Okay. Now, in this graph, it's nice because we start at zero, and each of these are equally spaced. But in this graph, if we're not careful, we'll mislead people because we have, uh, we have tried to tell them that there is a gap here, that we have scrunched the, the uh, chart up, we've skipped a bunch of data, and instead of having this all of this space here, we've moved 65 to down here. And what this does is this exaggerates the difference between the two and also this way. So by... Uh, changing the vertical scale, it's not a good idea to do that. Um, you have to be careful. Um, it, it exaggerates these differences. So it's not a good practice. If you uh, don't point it out, it's considered a misleading practice. So it's definitely something you don't want to do. Um, if, you do uh, if you do skip values, again, make sure you clearly annotate it on the graph. And then even in the wording, when you're describing this, mention it so that it's uh, clear that you're not trying to hide anything or make something look uh, different than it is. Because over here, you can see that the differences are small. But over here, they look much larger. Okay, So it's always important to look at the actual values to see how far apart they are. Okay, Now... Here's a question. What's the increase in average life expectancy from 2000 to 2010 for women? So women are the purple. So I can look at this value and this value. And so for women, it's going to be 80.6 minus 79.7, which is equal to 0 0.9 years. For men, it's going to be 74.1 minus 73.0, which is 1.1 years. All right. So I hope that uh, helps you know how you calculate things and look at things on the uh, bar graph. Okay. So now let's talk a very, about a very special type of bar graph. It's called a Pareto chart. And what we do here is we, you see that the values are going down. So we sort this from highest to lowest. Now, in this case, it was a, where a person for uh, several months, they, uh, each day they accounted for the reason that they were not uh, to class on time. 
So they snoozed after the alarm, they had car trouble, they took too long for breakfast, uh, they studied at the last minute, they're trying to find something to wear, talking to their roommate, or some, something else. And so then they take and we create a bar graph, which is, again, very easy to do. We have two axes, you know, and we put uh, frequency on the vertical axis if we're going to turn it this way. And then we put the uh, reason along the other uh, axis. And so we, we label each bar. And again, it's a good idea to put these data labels so that no one has to try to estimate these values. Okay. And so we order them from decreasing to, uh, from the largest to the smallest in de decreasing order so that we know which one to look at first. Usually these are uh, something we might use for problem solving. So just like this person, she wanted to know uh, what is it that she needs to tackle first to make her on time more. So that would be her last minute studying. How does she address her last minute studying so that she's not running late for class? And then before that and after that, she would want to tackle uh, snoozing. And what could she do to take less time for breakfast? And then how could she avoid talking to the roommate too long, etc.? Okay. So she knows the order in which to address uh, these uh, causes of her being late. All right. So those are bar charts, Pareto charts, and we talked about an ogive. Okay. So that's it for this lecture. Please remember to scan your lecture notes by midnight on the due date for this video. Uh, please make your notes neat for you. Include what you need in order to be able to go back and recall uh, how to do or how to understand the topic. And uh, there's nothing really to update on your formula sheet this time, but if there were, you definitely want to make sure you do that. If you have questions, please come to my virtual office hours. And if you need a question answered before then, you're welcome to email me. We will see you next time. Until then, think statistics.